Uh, today we'll talk about some things that maybe you have heard before about uh, how the classification and management of adenocarcinoma of the lung has changed. So this uh, classification system, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer and the American Society of Thoracic uh, and the European Respiratory Society all have uh, come together to create a new classification system about four years ago. Um, and that has some important implications in terms of how we report and how we uh, manage the specimens. Uh, so we want to talk about that, and I know you're doing uh, many molecular genetic evaluations of these problems because lung cancer is a big problem uh, worldwide but I think more and more in Vietnam. Um, since I've been here, I know one friend has died of lung cancer and another friend has a father with lung cancer. Uh, and so this is a, big, a growing problem for Vietnam um, and many other developing countries. Um, and this is very sad because we know uh, that this is, has a definite risk factor from tobacco use and smoking, um, both primary use and what we call secondhand, you know secondhand? Secondhand smoke, uh, you sit next to them and they smoke and you smoke too. Um, but thankfully there are some therapies that can improve uh, the outcome and that helps us uh, a little bit. Uh, so there are several uh, things to understand about uh, the precursor lesions for uh, lung cancer, uh, particularly adenocarcinoma. And this, I think, is a nice uh, summary of these. Uh, atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, peribronchiolar metaplasia, and then ultimately adenocarcinoma in situ, which is a precursor or a, a subsequent event to either one of these, depending on which cell has been uh, involved. Um, and just to contrast, uh, you know, the spacing between cells cell shape and size is very important. So anything less than five millimeters, one microscopic field essentially, is likely a precursor. Whereas if it's greater than a centimeter, then it's probably in situ or potentially worse. So what do you do between five and 10? Well, that's a good question. I don't, there's not a category there, is there? So probably you just make your best determination and communicate the, the concern. Um, all of these have the potential uh, to go on. Um, and notice that cilia may be present in the, some of the early precursor lesions as well, whereas in adenocarcinoma in situ, no more cilia. Um, it's also important to understand that the progression from those lesions to an invasive carcinoma and to a clinically recognized carcinoma can be quite long. So for uh, some carcinomas like adenocarcinoma, you see it takes a long time for this average tumor to double in size. So there may be almost a decade between the initial event and the clinical appearance of the tumor. Uh, whereas for small cell carcinoma, it's much quicker, uh, but still on the order of years. Um, we also know uh, that cancer is a genetic disease and there are molecular events that are happening uh, along this schema before we develop an invasive carcinoma. Um, so this diagram sort of gives you one pathway, and it's likely that there are probably more pathways as there is in colon cancer, uh, but these are some of the ones that we know. And notice how many different changes are required as we start with certain chromosomal losses. Uh, somewhere in the middle, we get a P53 mutation, cyclin, D and E1 overexpression is a late stage. So each one of these hits 
requires some sort of mutation event, some sort of other change to happen uh, for this to develop. Many of these are proto-oncogenes, some are tumor suppressor genes, as well as telomerase in act activation. So as we've talked about, the precursor lesion of atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, I think we see this uncommonly. Most of the time we see this as, oh, it's also here next to the cancer. So we may see a lesion like this near a cancer or at autopsy or another time. Um, this is a diagnosis that is size-based, less than five millimeters. Um, atypical cytology, an architecture that still preserves the architecture of the um, uh, alveolus. So there's no extensive fibrosis, there's no scarring, there's no invasion. So here's some more examples. Here, a small, low power view, one microscopic field. The cells are atypical. They can have a hobnail appearance, slightly crowded, um, and have uh, nuclear chromatin abnormalities. So going on here to what this uh, classification system has done for us, um, there are a couple of things to, to notice. Uh, first of all, we've We've added this category of adenocarcinoma in situ. Uh, we have defined a group that are termed minimally invasive. These are big changes in the classification system. Um, we've made some additional changes in terms of uh, things like uh, micropapillary predominant variations and so forth, and uh, classified other uh, variants of adenocarcinoma. Um, some of which may, for example, mucinous adenocarcinoma now includes uh, certain things that were separated out before. So why, why do we do this? Why change the classification system? Is it so that all these people can write a paper and give talks? Why, why would we change the classification system? Yeah, we, we, the understanding changes, the treatment changes, and we begin to see biology a little differently. So this is primarily driven by following patients and seeing which patients do well. For example, these patients do very well and therefore can potentially be treated differently than patients with this variant who do very poorly. Um, so these are the reasons why uh, this has uh, been studied and why it's coming forward. Uh, this is the primary reference for this study, but there are several others um, out there. So these are some of the things that we know, um, that different tumors have different behavior and prognosis based on stage or type um, at certain stages of, of development. And we know now that there are certain therapies for certain molecular things that are very valuable and very useful for the patients to get a very good response. So that's important. There are still some unknown things. Uh, we don't know exactly how certain tumors in certain size ranges will behave because we have very few studies. Or we don't know if there are other molecular pathways or other targets that may be uh, able to predict. And we also don't know when we handle a small sample and the tumor is big, how representative that is of the full tumor. So tumors are variable. One area will show one thing, one area will show another thing. We don't understand how variable the molecular events are in that tumor based on the morphology differences that we might see. Uh, so that, when we get to mixed cancers, that becomes a 
confusing issue to understand and to properly quantify. We also don't know how well pathologists will do with this new scheme. So this uh, classification was published, but no data as to how well it can be applied in a hospital like yours or in a setting like mine. So nobody said, will this work? Uh, they just said, this is what we think is good, and so do it. But they didn't test to see, can we do it well? Can we reliably differentiate these types? And that's an important question uh, for you, for your hospital, for all of Vietnam, for all of the other areas where people try to apply this. And we'll talk about what some of those issues are. So as this um, classification was published, along with it were uh, details as to why and what the recommendations were. I'm going to go through some of those recommendations from this paper uh, to talk about these. So uh, these are sort of the high level main points of this new classification. Uh, we don't anymore have bronchoalveolar carcinoma. We don't use that term. Uh, we now have new types, things that we call lipidic, or we have now micropapillary. Certain other types are abandoned, clear cell, signet ring cell, so forth. Mucinous carcinomas are all put together. Um, and we have added a new type, the enteric type of carcinoma. We don't use the term mixed, but we still quantitate when there is more than one pattern. Um, and so we'll talk about how these things play out. So one of the first recommendations is uh, to eliminate the use of the term bronchoalveolar carcinoma. So Formerly, we used uh, this term for several things. Um, and these are areas where now we might be able to still use this term, but we've chosen other terms. So adenocarcinoma is something in situ, is a new concept, um, either mucinous or rarely mucinous, where previously we might have said bronchoalveolar carcinoma. Um, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma might also look like this, but probably would have been called invasive carcinoma. Um, now we also have lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma, which is not minimally invasive, fully invasive, but it has a little bit of this pattern. Um, and then adenocarcinoma with some non-mucinous components um, that also had this pattern of spread at the edges of the tumor. Um, and then finally, uh, mucinous adenocarcinoma oftentimes has this lipidic pattern of spread, uh, and now we would just call this mucinous carcinoma. So these are the areas where we might have previously thought bronchoalveolar carcinoma, we're not going to think that anymore. Um, so here's another example of adenocarcinoma in situ. Notice that this size is still small. Um, this is 10 millimeters by definition, but it's, that's still small. And here you see the cells are a little bit more crowded. Nuclei are atypical. Um, and there's no thickening. The alveolar walls here are not appreciably thickened. The alveolar spaces are still preserved even though the lining cells are atypical. Here's a higher power. You see still a thin wall, but these atypical cells. This would be the more conventional or clara cell type. There are also a mucinous variety of adenocarcinoma in situ. That would be, look something more like this, where you see taller cells and columnar mucinous epithelium it would look like this appearance. 
And you see it's still growing along these delicate uh, alveolar walls. So lipidic growth, this is derived from something that looks like a scale. So it's on the surface. Um, this is the important thing, is it maintains the architecture of the alveolus. And there's no scarring or otherwise. The alveolar septa may be slightly thickened. Here, you see just very slightly thickened, a little bit of collagen here. Uh, slightly thickened, and it will have cuboidal, maybe columnar epithelium if it's a mucinous, and there's no stratification. Um, importantly, we don't want to see papillary structures because that will move it into a different category. Uh, so a mucinous adenocarcinoma in situ, this pushes the limit a little bit with this scar-like area here you might begin to wonder if this is invasive. Uh, but by and large, everything is alveolar walls, and here you see what these look like. The alveoli will be filled with mucin. So this will have a more glistening color as you look at it, sort of a yellower or, or glistening uh, gross appearance. So this is the next recommendation I want to emphasize. For anything that's less than three centimeters and has a solitary lipidic growth pattern, an invasion that's less than five millimeters, they have suggested we use the term minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. For this reason, these patients have very good survival. Okay, now what about this? Why did they say three centimeters? What if you have a 3.5 centimeter lesion, but less than five millimeters of invasion? Should you still call it this? We don't know. And the reason we don't know is that there aren't very many cases. So usually by the time it reaches three centimeters, the, inva the invasion is bigger than five millimeters. So then it becomes more fully invasive. Um, but theoretically, you could have a 3.2 centimeter tumor with less than five millimeters of invasion and you would be stuck. Probably most people would still call it minimally invasive and write a note. So how do we call invasion? What, what tells us that it's invasive? Well, there are both architectural patterns as well as um, histologic patterns. So if it has an acinar pattern, the glands are oval rather than more cuboidal or length, lengthwise, um, then that would mean it's invasive. If it has a papillary growth pattern, or especially a micropapillary pattern, it's going to be termed invasive. Um, anything that's solid, obviously you would call that invasive, um, and polygonal tumor cells and so forth. Um, there are other things that we could use to classify something as invasive. For example, um, if we have broad regions of scarring, that usually means invasive. So this is just not just thickening of the walls, but actual scarring or dense fibrosis. Or once the glands start to have odd shapes, uh, or we don't have macrophages in the airspaces that usually means it's a neoplastic invasive gland. And then the usual features, uh, blood or lymphatic invasion, but also pleural invasion. And to evaluate that, sometimes you need to do an elastic stain to see the elastic lamina of the pleura. And then we've talked about the architectural patterns. So, Here's a small lesion, 
Why do we call this minimally invasive? Well, we see here there's just a very small area here where it has lost the architectural pattern. See, it has this more dense scarring and irregular glandular appearance. Um, but this is a situation where you have to use judgment and you need to measure. So you have to actually measure the size of the invasive component. How big, how much of this can you call invasive? Now here's a question. If I have all of you measure this tumor, how close will you be? What is the coefficient of variation between pathologists? If you all measure this, I think some will measure seven millimeters, or some will measure five, or some will measure four. There will be some variation here. So this measurement is hard to be reproducible. Um, so especially anything that is close to the five millimeter cutoff, I would say show your colleague. Get other people's opinion. How big is this invasion? so that you have a better chance of being consistent. Um, if it's clearly just a few millimeters of invasion, fine. If it's clearly a full centimeter, fine. But if it's somewhere between four and seven millimeters, I would show other people to get their opinion so that you can be as precise as possible. Here's another example of a minimally invasive tumor. Um, this one has a mucinous pattern. We see the columnar cells here. But see this area here is thicker. The glands are different or odd shapes. There's more thickening of the spaces here. So this area would be an invasive area. And you should then measure that. If it's less than five millimeters, you're good to call it minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. So what do you think? Can we accurately measure or estimate the size of invasion? How many say yes? So how many say no? Who doesn't know? <laughs> Who didn't vote? <laughs> yeah. It's a hard question. We haven't proven that this can happen. So this could be a good study. If you wanted to publish a paper, just give your colleagues 10 cases of minimally invasive adenocarcinoma and see how close uh, their measurements are. So a tumor like this, out here, it might look like lipidic pattern growth. But over here, see how they're closer together. There's no alveolar space. This has become a fully invasive adenocarcinoma, even though at the edges it has a lipidic pattern. So this is no longer minimally invasive. This is an invasive adenocarcinoma with lipidic growth. So that's that classification scheme. You could call that the, the, the yeah, so if you have a core biopsy that's just this, uh, we're, we're going to talk about how to handle small samples, biopsies. Because this classification, you, there are some certain things you should do or say or not say with small samples, cytology or core biopsies. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, here's another example of a more fully invasive pattern. Uh, loss of alveolar spaces, columnar cells, necrotic debris, no alveolar macrophages here, just mucin um, in these fields. These again would be fully invasive and then could be subtyped. What does this pattern look like? Papillary, yeah. And this one, micropapillary. Very good. So this is more conventional papillary, broad, and this is the micropapillary pattern. And both of these are invasive carcinomas and important types 
to document in your report. So here's a higher power view. It sort of looks like serous carcinoma of the ovary, doesn't it? See? Micropapillary, hobnail cells, um, high-grade nuclei. Here's another one. I like this pattern. <coughs> now this is the mucinous type of invasive carcinoma. And in order to call it mucinous, you need to have a certain number of, if it's solid like this, you need to be able to find mucin droplets in about five or six cells per high power field. You can use a uh, mucin stain like PAS to demonstrate that if you need to. Uh, but that's the purpose for this. <coughs> Here's another example of some of these uh, types. Um, <coughs> colloid carcinoma and cystadenocarcinoma previously, these would all be grouped together in terms of mucinous or colloid type of carcinoma, mucinous adenocarcinoma. The fetal type we still use. This is a rare type. Uh, looks quite unusual. And then the enteric type I'll talk a little bit more about later because this is another new uh, term that has been added. Uh, this subtype can be very confusing because, not because it is hard histologically, but because the immunomarkers of this subtype can look almost exactly like metastatic colon cancer. So you see this tumor and it looks like colon cancer. It's a large cell glandular invasive carcinoma with some mucin and so forth, and probably some necrosis. And you wonder, could this be colon cancer? And so you do these markers, CDX2 or villain, CK20, these are all good markers for colon cancer. But the enteric type in the lung will often express these. And as well, some but not all the cells usually will also lose markers of lung <coughs> differentiation like TTF1, Napsin, or CK7. So it often requires that you correlate the clinical history very carefully and look um, for co-expression of any marker that's both enteric and lung to be able to make this diagnosis. If these are all positive, these are all negative, then you have to rely on the clinical presentation. Does it look like a primary lung cancer or is there a possible history of colon cancer as well? And work together with your clinical colleagues. 